So what are some of the worst species of wood to use for timber framing? And what are some of the best? I'd like to share my perspective and opinion from experience I've had as a timber framer. Woods to stay away from. Spruce. Spruce shrinks endwise and that creates a lot of problems. Most woods do not. Most woods shrink perpendicular to the grain and around the log, but spruce shrinks endo, that's a problem. On one particular project, I didn't know it did that, and we housed our joints in like normal, and then a year later, they were just hanging from the screws, and the builder had to put some black decorative hangers on there. And if we do it again, the housings will either be deeper or they'll have some sort of some sort of bracket to, to hide that shrinkage. It is rather cheap if this is faux timber framing inside of a home or inside of a project where it's just for looks. Structurally, it's really soft. I mean, it's chiseling out just like chiseling butter, which is a bad sign if you're looking for structural. Another species to stay away from is pine. It's not very strong and it's got a lot of pitch. It bleeds a lot of pitch. Pine has a lot of colorful knots. So we talked about spruce, shrinking endo, pine being weak and full of sap. Another one that I don't really like is hemlock. It's graded as the same strength as Doug fir, which I don't believe that, I've used it. And the reason I think it falls in the same strength category is that it doesn't have many knots. So if you don't have knots, you have more predictability with, will this piece of wood cave, bend, and then break? And that's what strength of lumber is being graded on is, is it gonna fail? Bending, you know, if you can take tolerable bending, it might look ugly, but it's still not gonna kill anyone or fall down and cause problems. That's where the engineering piece of and lumber grading comes in. It's still hemlock, and when I've used hemlock, it's, you need super sharp tools. It's like if you try to cut a tomato with a dull knife, tomato is really soft, but you need a sharp knife to cut it. Hemlock's kind of the same way. And it's really prone to twisting a lot. But it, hemlock is by far better than pine if I had to choose between the two, for sure. It's used in many places you know, over the, through the Midwest and on the East Coast. You see that a lot with timber framers using it. I'm sure it grows there and is cost effective. My own take on it is those timbers are gonna have a lot of love put into them. They're gonna be figuring out where to put them, how many to have, how big, what kind of truss, what kind of look and feel you're looking for. This is a big deal. And if you're starting with inferior wood, it really seems like stepping over dollars to pick up dimes. So much effort goes into these timbers that, you know, if it's just inside or if it's just faux timber framing, just to capture that look and feel, I'll grant that, that work then. But, but if there's any exterior exposure to the elements or any structural considerations, my own self, I put on the brakes. So the top three woods I really like, Doug fir, oak, and cedar. And with cedar, I include sequoia and bedwood. Kind of the same thing. And there's one other cedar that is kind of an outlier. It's called Port Orford Cedar, really strong. We did one project with it years ago. It's a really unique smell. It smells good. They use that, use that wood. It's so stable and strong, they use it for arrows. It only grows in Oregon and it's hard to get big pieces, so not really a viable option. Regular cedar, so western red cedar and sequoia and redwood, they all have properties that help them not rot. Certain oils in the wood. So for exterior applications, open pavilions, you can let them gray out and they kind of have their own maintenance program built in, their own protection. Or if you like dark woods or colorful woods like the redwood or the sequoia or the cedar, they have their own color and that may be something that you're looking for. 
on the flip side, you won't be able to stain it any color you want because it's already got a predominance in one direction. So that's something you want to think about as well. With cedar, the biggest downside is its weakness. If you want a bigger span or something that has tension loading, then you really got to fight that. And maybe your style is really where you're going to use big, chunky, massive, herky pieces, and then it's going to be okay for even say spanning 30 feet with a truss that's made out of cedar. It's going to take some big pieces, some creative use of metal if you want to hide the metal, and cedar is soft. I mean, it just doesn't take those tension forces nor the compression forces that that happen when you get into bigger spans. Other than that, cedar has got a kind of a nice grain pattern. Now, talking about oak. Oak has a very pretty grain pattern. It's very strong. It's perpendicular to grain strength is exactly the same as the parallel to grain. So by parallel, if you had the piece of wood on its side, lengthwise, you had two forces. How much force does it take to slide on itself? That's parallel to grain. And oak is strong either way. So oak is great for bigger spans or high tension loads. Problem with oak is you generally have to use box heart, which I'll get into how it tends to corkscrew when we talk about Doug fir. And it's hard to get long lengths and big sizes. The tree grows all over and it's just harder to do. And then of course, because the grain is so twisty and wild, the piece of wood generally has its own mind as well. And there's a joke in the Timber Framers Guild, a lot of the conferences that I went to, people have joked that if you're gonna use green timbers with white oak, stall it fast, because if you wait too long, you might not get everything to come together. It just really goes crazy. So you get it installed and then it somewhat strong arms that shrinkage and movement. But that's a, a, there's a lot of shrinkage of the oak and it's really volatile as far as its movement. So that brings us to Doug Fir, my top choice for timber framing. It's got some oranges and some colors that are really pretty, but not so strong that you can't use stain to get the color you want, but still have the grain patterns. Except stain, the thing that I really like about it is the availability. So we're cutting huge logs. We cut a log that's 54, 52 inches wide. So we can get free of heart timbers, big sizes, you know, up to 44 feet long is our capabilities. If there was one thing that I could change about Doug Fir, it would be it's perpendicular to grain strength. How, we talked about cedar being really easy to split. Doug Fir is probably between cedar and oak, somewhere kind of in the middle when you're talking about splitting a piece of wood. So that means you have to watch, mind your P's and Q's, how far close your pegs get to the edges to resist that perpendicular to grain breaking or splitting. Aside from that, even Doug Fir, how it behaves when it shrinks, it really doesn't shrink too much. And if you can get free of heart, pretty stable piece of wood that might move a little bit in, in a bigger the piece gets, the more strong-willed it becomes. There's more there to where nature's gonna kind of do its thing, but in general, pretty stable. And about half the shrinkage of oak. And maybe the last thing I wanna to touch on when you're thinking about species is generally, if you look at the end of a log, there's the heart, which is just a dot, the center of the bullseye, and then you've got wider and wider growth rings, kind of like a racetrack. Well, with Doug Fir especially, the racetrack on the outside is gonna shrink more than the racetrack on the inside. So when that happens, there's gonna be a check somewhere in the log, or if you have a box heart timber, somewhere on that timber, it's gonna check and it's gonna go to the heart. That's just nature. You're gonna have more shrinkage on the outside. So when that happens, you get the white check. And if you happen to have sloped grain on that timber, where the grain, where the check cracks and it's not parallel to the edge of the wood, well then that 
is gonna, every time it pops open, it adds a little like a notch, like a <laughs> ratchet. And that's where you get the corkscrewing action in boxed heart wood, which is why we try to avoid boxed heart and we get free of heart center with our timbers. So where you are on your timber framing journey, what this information means to you, you may be able to take it and kind of think, okay, well, we'll cross that bridge when we, when we come to it. If it's got you concerned, I would say, don't be overly worried about it. As you move forward, your timber framer is gonna help you with those decisions of what to use, your cost benefit analysis, all of that. And if you happen to want more, it's chapter 16 in this book, talks about drying and shrinking and technical aspects of timber framing with regards to the type of wood you're gonna use. The takeaway would be have some fun with it. Don't sweat it too much, it's gonna be okay. Thanks.